Morning all. Morning. Hello. Morning. Welcome. Good to see you all. Good to see you if, if you are online with us, if I can get my words out. Let's, uh, yeah, we're going to enjoy God this morning. He is, he is wonderful. He loves us. He sings over us. And we're going to sing back at him and, and declare how great he is. That's the general, general format. Um, but yeah, we're going to have a time of worship first. So John and Alicia are going to lead us in that. Uh, we're going to have some notices that Joelle's bringing. Give me a wave, Joelle. You're here. You are here. Hello, mate. You're dead bang in front of me. Sorry. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> and Danny's going to come and preach and uh, teach us from the next bit out of Daniel that we're doing in this series. So that's the kind of way that we're going. My name's Mark. This is Elizabeth. Uh, we're hosting. So I want to encourage contributions. Great on Wednesday night. Sorry, Elizabeth. I'm going on. Uh, it was great on Wednesday night to have uh, so many, you know, prophetic words, just just digging into God. I want to encourage that this morning among us as well. Um, so let's stir ourselves in that. But uh, before I run away and, and it's five past ten already, then uh, I'll hand over to Elizabeth who can encourage us to worship. Good morning and good morning if you're with us online, you're very welcome. So um, the last few days I've had um, a few verses on my heart from 1 Peter 2 um, and I believe this morning that the Holy Spirit really wants to encourage us and edify us and comfort us um, by reminding us about our, our identity this morning in Jesus, in, in Christ. So I'm going to read these few words, they're very familiar, but I encourage you, listen again carefully and let the Holy Spirit move you deeply with the truth of your identity in Jesus. Because in, in that place and from that place, you can move out in the wonder and worship um, of our God and really begin to appreciate again his beauty and mercy so this is 1 Peter 2 starting at verse 4 uh, the subheading the living stone and a chosen people even that is incredible but uh, verse 4 as you come to him the living stone rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him so this is talking about Jesus you also we also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And then further on in verse 9, you are a chosen people, we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him, that's God, who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Let's worship the Lord in the wonder of beauty and majesty. Great, would you like to stand?
this place this morning. You're the one who is seated on the throne. Lord, you reign far above all other powers and authorities. Lord, your name is the name that is above every other name that can be given. this is for anybody or any people who are a bit nervous about standing before God in this way and, and being personal with him in this way or if it's probably more about just a statement of who God is um, but unusually for me I've got a bit out of um, the line the witch in the wardrobe um, where the, I think I don't really know it very well but I know I know this particular bit of the quote is he quite safe I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. And we know that Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, C.S. Lewis was a, a, a Christian, amazing man of God, and it's really about a battle about good and evil, and Aslan stands there as, as, as God. So is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he's not safe, but he's good. We come this morning, absolutely, yeah. We come this morning before a God who isn't safe. Of course he's not safe, but I tell you what, he is good. He is so good and he's so, so, he's worthy of our praise, but we, it, it, praise overflows out of our relationship to him. It's not like a, uh, it's not like a tough thing for us to do. This is, this is a good and easy thing almost for us to do, to come before our God and say, God, you're worthy because he really is really is he's good the lion in the lion the witch in the wardrobe Aslan I had a picture of him if any of you've seen the film he's tied down on a big um, uh, in a, on a big rock he's really sad he's he's worn and he look it looks awful and then the ray of the ropes break and he stands up and he roars he roars and uh, and it's um, I think it he wants to tell us about Jesus being released and Aslan is released in the story I just I felt for people who today might feel tied down you might feel tied down your hands are like this you're nervous what is someone going to say about me? But God will release those ropes and you can roar like, like, like Aslan did. Okay, so there's real power of the kingdom here this morning. The Lord Jesus is risen and what we're experiencing here by the Holy Spirit's presence is the resurrected Jesus in power among us, which means that he's here to bless us and to minister to us. Uh, La has a word uh, uh, in a tongue that she wants to bring. But just before that, I just want to read you from Revelation um, our response uh, in these moments to the very presence of God. We can cry with heaven, you're worthy our Lord and God to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being and you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation you made them to be a kingdom of priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth there's something of the kingdom advancing upon us here folks this morning so let's just um just stay in this place of receiving you might want to close your eyes open up your hands now as law ministers to us <laughs>
the interpretation among that anyway. Let's just wait a moment. The guys continue to play, obviously. Let's wait a moment, see if anybody's got any more of an interpretation on that. And then we'll, we'll move on from that part. But let's not rush. You are so beautiful, my God. You are so beautiful, my God. There is no one like you. There is no place like belonging to you and being with you. How we love you, Jesus. We worship you. Okay, let's press in, guys. Let's press in. It's almost like leaning into God as we worship. I'm going to hand back to the guys, but let's... This is a precious place, precious moment.
ways. But what I want, Jesus wants to share with us this morning is that there was, from Jesus on the throne, there was an enormous sense and waves of love and goodness and everything that we know Jesus can give us. But it was an enormous wave of love and we were just kneeling and sitting in awe of Jesus. So I just want to just say thank you, Jesus, for that. To just to just to share with that with us that you love us so much. You love us so much. Thank you, Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus.
God, how incredible you are. How wonderful you are, Lord. You move us, God. God, Father, you move us. You are incredible. God, we love you. We bring you praise and glory and honor. And Father, we're amazed at the place that you bring us to in Christ. How oh, amazing, Lord. Praise you, God. Amen. Amen. If you'd like to be seated. We're not quite finished our worship time. There's a few words that people have got that I want to draw out. But just before, before I do, and I might even repeat this afterwards, you know me. Just want to, the way that God this morning has moved among us and, and the thread of God's holiness and then the thread, thread, T-H, of, of freedom for us and how the two work together. Because you, you kind of think, well, the holiness of somebody would drive us away. But no, the holiness of God and the, and the love of God and the mercy of God actually drives us to him. Isn't it incredible? Isn't he incredible? Okay. Yeah, yes. <laughs> well, right answer. <laughs> I'm going to bring the mic to Leslie. Then Karen, I'm going to ask you to come up and just read those couple of lines that you got. All right, great. And then Helen, I'm going to ask you to sort of wrap us up and I might or might not avoid the tension of wrapping some more. <laughs> Earlier this morning, there was talk of the lion, Aslan, in the Narnia story, who was overcome by evil, and he was tied up with ropes and laid on a stone table. But there were those tiny little mice who were moved to come and to nibble away, nibble those ropes, and to set free the lion. And if any of us feel, and I'm sure some of us do, feel very weak and um, small and useless, but the little mice were used. When they were on their own, singly, they couldn't have done much. But when they were together, then they were able to bring freedom where it was needed. And let us be assured that God can use the smallest of us with great joy. Leslie, I know at times you feel feeble. You're a lion, mate. Yeah. <laughs> you are. In God, you stood. Karen, come and, come and read those couple of lines for us. I'm Karen, you know who I am anyway, so I'm going to start with this. God, most wonderful, God, most beautiful, God, most holy, more lovely, loving, loving, and more le lovely than we can think. it's all been said, my word, um, which was uh, originally about, we were singing about God being holy and how wonderful, we were worshipping him in heaven, weren't we, with the saints, I really believe we were, but uh, God wanted to say that, yeah, he's holy, he's wonderful, but he's holy and wonderful here now for us, in our lives, now, this minute. And I, I felt that there was somebody or some situation struggling. People felt, somebody felt under attack. Um, but look how great God is. He can deal with it. And have I got time to just give a quick testimony? Okay. Right, well, um, some of you who've known me a long time know that I've known, we, we sang about God being over our family in one of the songs, didn't we, as well as depression and many other things. Well, you know that um, I've had dreadful things happen in my family. Absolutely tragic, awful stuff. And I just want to 
share that I've prayed, I've prayed, I've prayed, I've prayed for years and years and years. And there are those among you who've done exactly the same for people in your families, okay? And I want to share with you a very encouraging thing that's happening. My little grandson, Theo, is getting baptised this afternoon. It's an Anglican baptism, it's a sprinkle. But, you know, it's a confession of faith from this little, little lad in my family. He's about 13. And um, my husband and I are going. Phil is going. And... Um, his little sister also, I believe, has not yet made any confession of faith. But I just worship God, because this has come out of nowhere. And it's such an answer to prayer. And I just worship the Lord. If he can do it in my family, he can do it in yours. The victory is the Lord's. What you've just been singing. Just, hallelujah, Jesus. Helen said to me before, she said, I've got something else that might or might not be real. She said, it's basically saying Jesus has the victory. Yeah. And he does. And we sang that in the song, didn't we? Yeah, I, I was really moved. Shout Jesus for my family. Jesus in the streets. Jesus over, over everything. That's, that's who we are. That's, that's what we declare. It's, uh, yeah, great. If you've got the bit where it says, shout Jesus for my dad. Um, that's it. Jesus for my family. Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every, every enemy, Jesus for my family, Jesus, I speak the holy name. Isn't that the thread of what we've been declaring, praising this morning, the holiness of God and the freedom that he brings? I speak the holy name of Jesus. Guys, keep praying, keep digging into him, keep being Jesus in the situations that he's placed you. Dan's preaching later, but I've sort of started already. <laughs> it's a good place that God has got us. Dig in in that place. Dig in in that place. Who knows what he has for us? It's great. It's so exciting. Joel, you've got notices, mate? Follow that, Joel. <laughs> oh, follow that, no problem. <laughs> well, good morning, church. Hope everyone is well. Hope you've enjoyed that time of worship at Tethemes and Mark's one minute prayer. <laughs> it's very good. <laughs> and I'm going to start with the notices. Uh, yesterday it was the uh, men's walk, and I'm going to pass over to John Addison to speak more on it. Thank you. Well, um, we have the lights off so we can see the. That's really good, that picture over there. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, as you'll see, there was a good over 20 of us. Um, I really don't want to forget to thank Roger for leading us on this walk. That was a, it was a fabulous walk, a lovely, lovely countryside. Uh, but I just wanted to um, dwell on what happened while we were enjoying God's creation in the countryside. What happened was there was a group of men of God. That's what happened. A group of men of God who walked together, but... As always with these walks, the walk is great, the talk is even greater, and the relationships that were built. I had some lovely conversations, I'm sure other people did, but I don't know about them, I only know about my own. But what I had was great. So it, there's something special about a group of men of God standing together, being with each other for longer than we get at the end of a service. Um, so. You know, I'm just waiting on God to see what else he has for us as a group of men. But just thank you guys for coming. We were truly blessed. We were blessed with the perfect weather. We were blessed with a wonderful walk. We were blessed with a great pub, with great lunch, great service. Yeah, it was really good. So thank you to all you guys for coming. Thank you to Roger for organising it. Thank you for, to God for blessing us on it. Thank you, John. Yeah, it's really good. Enjoyed it. Uh, next notice, on Thursday, which everyone knows what's happening on Thursday, uh, the church building will be closed as it's being used as a polling station. So there you go. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pass over to John, who's got a notice about Encounter. Thanks, John. So this is picking up on the theme of uh, elections and polling stations. Uh, on Wednesday is our normal uh, Encounter monthly in the evening. This is a time when we gather 
to seek the presence of God and to worship uh, and to see what he will say to us. Um, since it is the general election the next day, it's an important moment for the nation. Um, we are also going to take some time during that evening to pray uh, into the general election. Okay, so we'll be worshipping God, seeking his face, but we'll also be taking some time to pray about the general election. Do come along. Everybody welcome. If you've not been before, they're great times. Um, come along and come along and pray into uh, the future of the nation too. Right, thank you, John. So the, uh, the week after that will be our... Um uh, Holy Spirit uh, midweek uh, Holy Spirit and gives gifts uh, and that is also available on the members uh, oh wait, 17th oh okay, not the 10th sorry I got it completely wrong <laughs> the 17th um, but yeah the, 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 the last two last two sessions are available on the members only area on the website and you need Church Suite to log into that if you have trouble with Church Suite then you can ask Sam who is waving behind at the back over there <laughs> and I'm going to pass it to Lou Scott who has a notice to give Oh, and Shelley, I'm not aware. Do you want to not put Shelley on the list? That's all right. Do you want to... Um, this, is your, this is Shirley's vision, so I'm not going to steal her thunder. I'm just going to let it explain, and then I'll do the bit that I said I would do. So, hi, everybody. I'm up here again. <laughs> um, yeah, um, we're going to have a, a games and supper evening on Saturday the 10th of August at this church, and it will be from 5 p.m., um, and it will finish about nine o'clock, but we are going to have a supper. And um, so if people want to purchase ticket, it would be for uh, either fish and chips, uh, sausage and chips, and cheese and onion. And it's going to be a games night. So anyone who loves games, board games, geeky cards, um, can come, uh, welcome to come. Of course you can. <laughs> Is it up there? Oh, it's up there already. Um, yes, yeah, so... Oh, is it? Oh. oh, that's the deadline for the um, for, to getting the ticket. So I'll pass you the rest over to Yeah, we uh, decided to get together, uh, those of us who like this sort of games. Um, we're running a fish and chip supper, which we're doing through a local fish and chip shop. Um, in order to make it easier for us, we've rounded all the money up to six pounds. So if you, uh, any of the additional amounts will all be given to Close Bank. So just wanted to make that clear that um, the, we've just rounded some of the money up just for the ease of running this event. But any extra money that we get in at the end will be given to Close Bank and we can feed back to you what that amount will be. So if you want to um, uh, speak to either Shirley or myself, um, even if you're just sort of putting your name down and you want to pay at a later date, you can. This is just sort of, we're not, yeah, so card games, board games, come have fun with some friends who also like to do that and eat some food if you want to. If you want more information, speak to us afterwards. That would be great. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Shirley and Lou. Sounds very exciting. We'll put that in the diaries. Also, don't forget to put the 5th of August for Jamie's birthday to wish him then as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is that, there you go, 35, that's a big one. Very good. Uh, okay, so this week's special offering is for the general fund, which covers everything in do as a church. Um, that's the only offering. <laughs> I just read that. So the children and gig are staying in. KJ group is out in Diamond Room. And uh, for the children in Jam, there'll be activity packs at the back near the PA desk where my mum will wave and show you that it's there. Thank you. And um, you have a choice of keeping the children in, in, this, in this hall to do the activity pack, or you can take them down to the community hall, which you have to go with them and do the activity pack there. And the, the preach will be on the TV in that community hall. And then we'll give a quick intermission, and then Dan is preaching. Thank you.
additional notice. Uh, starting this Tuesday, we're uh, having builders in to do the work on the car park. Uh, we're extending uh, the concrete where the disabled space is uh, on that side. So from Tuesday, we're going to have builders in. We're going to try and minimise disruption to our normal church life, but just be aware that that's been going on from Tuesday. Okay. Let's pray, shall we? Yeah, Heavenly Father, thank you for what you've been doing amongst us this morning. All glory belongs to your name. Thank you that you are holy, that you are mighty, you are good. And we worship you and give you glory this morning. And pray that you'd speak to us now through your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, today is part two. You might have remembered probably about three weeks ago, I did Spiritual Realities, a, a talk on Daniel chapter <coughs> 7. Thank you. John remembers it. <laughs> so I've named this one Spiritual Realities Part 2 because we're going to be continuing the theme of uh, looking at, in the book of Daniel, the sort of questions it raises regarding the spiritual realm. And this week we're going to be focusing on angels and demons. Now, way back in the 1980s, one of my favourite TV shows was called Highway to Heaven. Do you remember that? Oh, that was me, a little kid, watching that. I used to love it. <laughs> now, the main premise of the show was an angel had come down to earth on probation um, in human form, and he had to travel around helping people in order to gain his wings and ascend into heaven. And he teams up with a retired cop who assists him in his quest. I loved it. I, I watched that a lot. <laughs> Now, yes, the theology of the show was extremely dodgy. Um, <laughs> but as a young kid, it grabbed my imagination and got me thinking about angels and if they walked amongst us. Of course, as I got older and I learned more of what the Bible had to say on things, I came to know that, yes, they do walk among us and they help us in many ways. Hebrews 13.2 says, Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For by, doing, for by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Now, we live in a society that still has a great interest in angels and demons. A society that, especially amongst younger people, has a hunger for the spiritual, a longing for something more than just the physical world around us. And this is often reflected in the media. You only have to turn on the TV to see some program or film that contains supernatural elements. There are not a huge number of films about angels, but there are many hundreds of films about demons. And as Christians, it's important we get a healthy balance when we consider topics such as the angels and demons. You see, some people can become obsessed by them, and they can, can become idols, such as the guardian angel charms you see about unfortunately sold in many cathedrals. As we return to the book of Daniel, we have already seen angels at work. Last week, John talked about how in chapter 9, Daniel, while he was praying, was visited by the angel Gabriel, and how Daniel's prayers were not only heard, but were powerful in the spiritual realm. And this week, we're going to use chapter 10 of Daniel as our springboard into looking at angels and demons. Now, I just want to recap some of the things we covered in my Spiritual Realities talk, part one, a few weeks ago. That God chooses to operate within a divine council or assembly in heaven made up of heavenly beings which he created. God doesn't need to, but he chooses to partner with these heavenly beings the same way he partners with us as Christians. And these heavenly beings are referred to in the Bible as sons of God, holy ones, watchers, cherubim and seraphim, archangels and angels. At some point, there was a rebellion in heaven led by Satan and members of God's divine council fell with him. And now an ongoing war rages in the heavenly realm. And Satan, with those other fallen heavenly beings, stand in opposition to God's will and purposes for the world and influence the kingdoms of the world for evil. Paul refers to them in Ephesians 6.12 as rulers, authorities, 
the powers of this dark world and spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So it's against this backdrop of a war in the heavenly realms that we come to Daniel chapter 10. It says this. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel, who was called Belteshazzar. It's a message was true and it concerned a great war. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. At that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips, and I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. On the 24th day of the first month, I was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris. I looked up, and there before me was a man, dressed in linen, with a belt of fine gold from Upaz around his waist. His body was like topaz, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and his voice sounded like a multitude. I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. Those who were with me did not see it, but such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. So I was left alone, gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale, and I was helpless. Then I heard him speaking, and as I listened to him, I fell into a deep sleep, my face to the ground. A hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, Consider carefully the words I'm about to speak to you, and stand up, for I have been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up, trembling. Then he continued, Do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me twenty-one days, then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I've come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future, for the vision concerns a time yet to come. While you were saying this to me, I bowed my face towards the ground and was speechless. Then one who looked like a man touched my lips and I opened my mouth and began to speak. I said to the one standing before me, I am overcome with anguish because of the vision, my Lord, and I feel very weak. How can I, your servant, talk with you, my Lord? My strength is gone and I can hardly breathe. Again, the one who looked like a man touched me and gave me strength. Do not be afraid. You are highly esteemed, he said. Peace, be strong now, be strong. When he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Speak, my Lord, since you have given me strength. So he said, do you know why I have come to you? Soon I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go, the prince of Greece will come. But first I will tell you what is written in the book of truth. No one supports me against them except my, Michael, your prince. So this morning we're going to focus on the spiritual realities that are angels and demons. Their role in the great heavenly war that rages and our response as Christians today. And we're going to do this under three headings. Angels, demons and us. Our passage in Daniel is set in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, which was about 536 BC. Two years earlier, the first party of Jewish exiles had returned to Jerusalem in response to Cyrus's decree. But by this point, they were facing severe opposition, and the rebuilding work of the temple in Jerusalem had ground to a halt. And you can read about it in Ezra chapter 4. Now, Daniel would have most likely received reports coming out of Jerusalem, informing him of the great struggle his people were facing there. And on top of that, Daniel had had a vision about a great conflict which exposed the ongoing spiritual warfare in the heavenly realm. All this causes Daniel to mourn and fast for three weeks. All these visions Daniel has has had a huge effect on him. And back in chapter 8, verse 27, after the vision, Daniel says, he says, I, Daniel, was worn out. 
I lay exhausted for several days. You can imagine the state he was in when he was standing by the River Tigris. And suddenly I looked up and there before me was a man dressed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Uhaz around his waist. His body was like topaz, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze and his voice like the sound of a multitude. All Daniel's friends had legged it in terror, even though they couldn't even see the vision of this man. And it very much sounds like, in verse 8, that Daniel was about to pass out himself. He was being met by another angel. If you remember, he'd already met with the angel Gabriel back in chapter 9, but this angel is unnamed. And as you read through the description of this man, you'll see lots of the similarities to the vision John has in Revelation of Jesus. The gold around his waist, skin like burnished bronze, eyes like flaming torches, and a voice like the sound of the multitude. But this is not Jesus. We can tell this because later on he explains in verse 13 that he'd been resisted by a demonic being, the prince of the Persian kingdom, for 21 days, and he needed the chief angel Michael to help him break through. I don't think if it had been Jesus, he would have needed rescuing. But this brings us to the first point I want to make about angels. Now, it's easy to jump to what their name means, and we'll get onto that. But the clue is in the similarities of this angel's appearance to that of Jesus in Revelation. You see, the primary purpose of ang- and role of angels is to bring glory to God. They were created by God to worship him, to sing of his everlasting glory. Psalm 29, 1-2 says, Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. And in Revelation 5, 11 and 12, it says, Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders in a loud voice. They were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and praise. You probably remember how Moses only saw God's back as he passed him on Mount Sinai. Yet his face glowed so brightly that they had to cover it with a veil. Angels have been present in the throne room of God. They have seen him face to face and they reflect that glory in a wonderful way. And this glory causes people to fall on their knees, shake in terror and cover their faces before them. But it is nothing compared with the glory of the living God, which we cannot fully see until we are with him in heaven. The angels serve God according to his will, bring about his purposes, not only in the heavenly realms, but on earth also. And we shall look at that a bit further later on. So the word angel comes from the Greek word angelos, but the meaning for that word comes from the Hebrew word malak, which means messenger. One too many? There we go. The Hebrew word is a lot more helpful because these days we tend to clump all heavenly beings other than God under the title of angel. But in the near Middle Eastern worldview, they would have seen clear differences between the roles of angels, messengers of God, and other heavenly beings such as cherubim and seraphim, whose roles involve guarding the throne of God, leading divine worship, and guarding God's sacred spaces such as the Garden of Eden. Now that's a fascinating rabbit hole, which we haven't got time to go down this morning, unfortunately. (laughs) So one of the key roles of angels is to deliver messages. We see this in our passage. The angel has arrived um, to bring a message of explanation of what will happen to Daniel's people in the future. And throughout the Bible, there are examples of angels bringing important messages to people. Probably the most famous is when the angel Gabriel appears to Mary and tells her that she is going to give birth to Jesus. But also, we see angels delivering warnings 
such as the Balaam and his talking donkey in Numbers 22. They bring messages of rebuke, such as when an angel rebukes Israel for their idolatry in Judges 2. And as we've seen in the book of Daniel, angels bring interpretation to the visions that Daniel sees. Angels are very much God's envoy. They represent extensions of God's authority and activity, beings mighty in strength who perform his word. Hebrews 1, 14 says, Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who inherit salvation? And this is another key role of angels. They minister to us. Now this is demonstrated beautifully in our Daniel passage. It's interesting just how much of this passage is given over to the ministering of the angel to Daniel. Daniel, who had no strength left, whose face was deathly pale and helpless. Daniel, who was trembling, speechless, overcome with anguish and feeling very weak, whose strength was gone and could hardly breathe. Daniel is in a right mess. But the angel gently and patiently ministers to Daniel, letting him sleep deeply, giving him the strength to talk, and giving him physical strength. The gentle words of encouragement in verse 19. Do not be afraid, you who are highly esteemed. Peace, be strong now, be strong. When he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Speak, my Lord, since you have given me strength. It's just such a wonderful example of an angel ministering to a weak and broken man. And we see this again with Elijah in 1 Kings 19, where Elijah has had enough and prayed that he might die. He falls asleep and an angel touches him and tells him to get up and eat, providing a meal of baked bread and a jar of water. The angel then lets him sleep after his meal before waking him again and telling him to get up and eat and drink again. Then he was strong enough to continue on his journey. It's just another wonderful example of God's love and care expressed through his ministering angels. Jesus, after his 40 days and 40 nights of fasting in the desert and being tempted by the devil, it says in Matthew 4, 11, then the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. No doubt providing food and and water for him. (coughs) Thank you. An angel delivered that earlier. Thank you. Yeah. And as our verse from Hebrews states, they minister to us today as believers. Angels help and provide needs to us as God commands them to. Now this couple here, Bob and Ada Hiley, used to go to my church in London when I was a young person. They've both gone to glory now. But Bob was called by God to set up an organisation called Book Aid, sending millions of books across mainly the African continent, Christian literature across Africa. And God called him to do that. They both lived by faith. They had no income. (coughs) They're totally reliant on what God provided for them. And as a teenager, I used to go and help load containers with books, get in the van, go around the country and pick up books to bring back to the headquarters and load into containers. And at the end of the day, Bob would always say to me, Dan, He had a huge library of books where he was. He said, go and choose a few books for yourself. You can take home. So I'd come back with a big pile of books. And then he'd sit me down and he'd start telling me stories of the amazing things God had done throughout their lives. And it would be miracle after miracle. They'd driven across deserts without any fuel in the car at all. Completely empty tank. But often, he would have a feeling from the Holy Spirit saying, go to the airport. He'd be like, okay, I'm going to the airport. I don't know why. He'd get to the airport. A complete stranger would walk up to him with an envelope full of money and say, go to this country. And it'd be just the right amount of money to get on the airplane. And off he'd go. He'd fly to the country. And when he got there, there'd be people there ready to meet him. He'd been told by God to meet him at the airport. And thus, the whole book aid network spread like a wildfire. He was a man of miracles. He lived in the miraculous, he trusted God, and he encountered angels on a regular basis. And I used to sit there with my jaw on the floor, 
going, wow. You also have one of those deep, booming voices, the type that really captures you. Sort of like, like, okay. But it's such an inspiration to me as a young person. I thought, wow, I want to live a life like that. Okay. So another role of angels. They are agents in bringing God's judgment. Now we see angels directly involved in carrying out God's judgments throughout the Bible. God sends two angels to Sodom and Gomorrah to tell Abraham's son Lot and his family to get out of there because they were about to destroy it. In Genesis 19, 12 to 13, it says, The two men said to Lot, Do you have anyone else here, sons-in-law, sons or daughters, or anyone else in the city who belongs to you? Get them out of here, because we are going to destroy this place. The outcry of the Lord against its people is so great that he has sent us to destroy it. Sodom and Gomorrah, with everyone in it, is then destroyed by these two angels. We see in 2 Kings 19, just one angel strike down 185,000 soldiers of the Assyrian army after King Hezekiah humbles himself before God. King David saw an angel with a sword drawn ready to destroy Jerusalem because of David's sin in 1 Chronicles 21.16. It says this, David looked up and saw the angel of the Lord standing between heaven and earth with a drawn sword in his hand extended over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders clothed in sackcloth fell face down. David repented and God stopped the angel from destroying Jerusalem with God commanding the angel, enough, withdraw your hand. And it was an angel referred to as the destroyer who struck down the firstborn of the Egyptians in Exodus, finally causing Pharaoh to let the Israelites leave Egypt. And we see angels bringing God's judgments in the New Testament as well. In Acts 12, we see King Herod Agrippa being struck down by an angel for not giving praise to God when people were calling him a god. In the book of Revelation, angels are active in bringing God's final judgments on the earth sounding the seven trumpets and pouring out the seven bowls of God's wrath. So angels are powerful spiritual beings. And as our passage in Daniel points um, to, they are actively engaged in a heavenly war. They can gently minister to people, but they are also fearsome warriors. And one of their key roles is to aid, protect and deliver God's people in times of danger. Now, we've seen this in the book of Daniel with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when the angel appears to them and keeps them from harm in the fiery furnace. It was an angel that shut the mouths of the lions when Daniel was cast into their their den. Back in Acts 12, we see an angel rescuing Peter from prison, causing his chains to fall away, the guards to remain asleep and an iron gate to swing open on its own. And Paul in Acts 27 received assurance from an angel of God that he and all those sailing with him would be safe. The angel's message provided comfort and confidence, and despite the shipwreck, everyone survived as promised. Psalm 91.11 says, For he will command his angels concerning you, to guard you in all your ways. And as we bring this section on angels to a close, just to note that in our passage in Daniel, the angel refers to Michael as one of the chief princes in verse 13. We also see the term archangel used in regard to Michael in Jude 1.9 when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses. So there is a ranking within angels, with archangels being the leaders with the greatest authority. Our passage also shows us that there are spiritual beings who also are called princes, as Michael is called, showing their beings of rank. However, these other spiritual beings stand opposed to God and his purposes. That leads us on. Look at demons. So if an angel's primary purpose is to bring glory to God, demons are the exact opposite. They oppose God. They hate what God stands for, and their mission is to deceive and drive people away from God. To bind and stop the mission 
and purposes of angels. Now, the Bible doesn't have a nice, neat chapter on the origins of demons, but it does give us a glimpse into the events which happened in the heavenly realms and who Satan is. Now, Satan is a title and simply means adversary or accuser. Whatever this heavenly being's real name was, we do not know, but what he became is why we assign the titles such as Satan, an adversary, an accuser of God and the saints, and devil, which means slanderer and adversary. Jesus describes the devil when he says in John 8, 44, he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Jesus also confirms that he witnessed Satan's fall in Luke 10, 18. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now, for further insight into what happened, Isaiah 14, 12 to 15, for many Bible scholars, is seen as comparing the king of Babylon to the fall of Satan. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. Satan's desire was to be like God. He wanted to assert God's throne, pride, greed, power, all leading to his fall and being cast down from heaven. Ezekiel 28, 12 to 17 gives us even more insight. It says this, This is what the Sovereign Lord says, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you, carnelian, crystallite, and emerald, topaz, oinks, and jasper, lapis lazuli, turquoise, and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, you were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. For you were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace on the mount of God, and I expelled you, guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. Now this is another Bible passage that many scholars believe is comparing an earthly king the king of Tyre, with what happened to Satan. It's interesting because it points to this heavenly being, Satan, as being a cherubim and not an angel. A guardian of the throne of God, cast out because of his pride and vanity. Now we often picture the devil as this uh, red evil looking creature with horns and a pitchfork. But in reality, he was and may well still be a being of great beauty another weapon he can deceive with. The Bible tells us that when Satan fell, a number of other heavenly beings fell with him. Revelation 12, 7 to 9 says, Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray, he was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Now we refer to these fallen heavenly beings as demons, evil spiritual beings who have rebelled against God and served Satan. Satan and his forces of darkness stand against everything God is, and their primary goal is to thwart the sovereign plan of God and to destroy God's people. They operate by influencing the kingdoms of this world, as our passage in Daniel shows us, attaching themselves to kingdoms and nations, and they are at war with the host of heaven. 
And they also tempt and influence individual people, leading them to bondage and darkness. But as we said this morning, they have lost this war. Jesus defeated them on the cross, and one day they will be utterly destroyed forever. The spiritual realities we've talked about today often go forgotten in our day-to-day lives. The war in the spiritual realm rages on as we sip our Costa coffees and do our normal activities. But as we finish this morning, I just want to look briefly on what is a healthy and wise reaction for us to these spiritual truths. Often the danger in the whole area of angels and demons is that people can become obsessed by them. Their main focus is taken away from God and onto these spiritual beings, which can cause all sorts of issues. People become obsessed with the idea of guardian angels and can enter a whole world of angelic mysticism, false religion and idolatry as these angels are ultimately worshipped. John in Revelation a couple of times on seeing the glory and wonder of the angel falls down to worship them. But it says in Revelation 22, 8 to 9, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. We are to worship God alone. Angels are fellow servants of our amazing, awesome God. Likewise, people obsess about demons, either end up worshipping them, getting involved in the occult, witchcraft, and other demonic activities. Or if they, or if they are Christian, end up with either a fear of them that controls their lives, or becoming overly familiar and confident in their abilities to tackle and defeat demons. Even the Archangel Michael in Jude 1.9 did not dare condemn Satan for slander, but instead said, the Lord rebuke you. Michael turned to God to deal with Satan. And Jesus sets the ultimate example for us. As he went about his ministry, he set his eyes not on the demonic, but on the will of his heavenly father. His eyes were set on his father's throne. And we're to set our eyes on our heavenly father and doing his will. And Jesus also sets the example of the importance of prayer. Living in the place of prayer is vital for all of us in a fallen world with a spiritual war raging around us. Daniel's prayers were powerful. They change things, not only in the physical world around him, but in the spiritual realm also. His prayers were heard by God. And when we are people who pray, then things change. God brings change into the physical world around us, but we are also supporting the war effort in the spiritual realm. So we are to keep our eyes fixed on our Heavenly Father, be a people who live in a place of prayer, and lastly, put on the armour of God see, our enemy is a deceiver, a slanderer, and a liar. And any one of the key ways the enemy likes to attack us is by destroying our identity as God's children. Yet when you look at the armour of God in Ephesians 6, so much of it is about protecting our identity as sons and daughters of God. The belt of truth. What is the truth God says about you? And who you are, and the truth of who you are. He is the bless, the breastplate of righteousness. You have been made righteous by the blood of Jesus shed on a cross. You stand in his righteousness, not your own. Feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. We can go and do anything God calls us to do, not with fear, but with the peace because of who he is and who he has made us. The shield of faith. I stand firm knowing who God is and what he has done, and I stand and nothing can snatch me out of his mighty hand. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The helmet of salvation, I am saved. I am loved. My eternal destiny is secure, and I need not fear death. And the sword of the Spirit, the truth of God's word, stands forever. The lies of the enemy crumble before it. When we put on the armor of God, our identity is secure. 
Our eyes are fixed on him and our enemy cannot accuse us. Angels and demons are a reality. But so is the one true living God, creator of all things, who has won the victory over Satan and the forces of darkness, who will one day destroy them completely and deserves all honour and praise forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray, shall we? Yeah. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are victorious. We thank you that when you went to the cross, you defeated Satan and all the forces of darkness when you shed your blood for us and when you rose again in victory. We thank you, Lord, yeah, that we can fix our eyes on you and fix our eyes on your throne and we need not be afraid because you are with us and you are for us and help us to do your will, Father. Help us to follow you wherever you lead us, knowing that you go before us. And Father, I want to thank you. Thank you for, the, for your angels that come and minister to us, even though we might not even realise, Lord. We just thank you for them. And yeah, we give you glory. And thank you that one day we will join them in heaven, worshipping you and singing, Holy, Holy, Holy. Lord God Almighty. Thank you for that amazing truth. You are glorious and wonderful. And we worship you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's finish with a song. Worship God. We stand. We're going to sing holy forever.
if you could switch song pro over to um, a couple of verses for me mate and then we could um, declare them together just in finishing um, so hopefully that's given you a moment um, so Romans chapter 11 I don't know if I can't quite see you are you all right with this <laughs> good stuff <laughs> thank you Romans chapter 11 and verse 33 if you can show that up <laughs> Nothing like being put on the spot, is it, mate? Sorry. <laughs> there we go. Thank you, mate. And we'll do to the uh, the end of the chapter. So let's let's um, read this together. O oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counsellor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. 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 We say amen, Lord. Amen. All power and glory to you, God. We thank you for this morning, Lord. We thank you for lifting our heads to see you again afresh, Lord. Continue to work among us. Continue to build us up, continue to equip us. Holy Spirit, continue to, to reveal truth. Equip us to be witnesses, Lord. God, be glorified in us and through us, Lord, please. Amen. Amen. It's great. That's um, for the end of the meeting. So for those who are online with us, thank you. And we'll see you again soon.